Um, my name's Annika and I'm from Assemble. We're a company of um, 20, a um, mixture of artists, designers and architects who started more or less by accident with a cinema project. We do quite a wide range of work um, for all public spaces and public realm work. Um, so I'm just going to take you two of our projects, which are the most cinematic, I guess, but also they were how we started. So probably... This is a um, quick little slideshow about our first project, which is called the Cinerarium. Um, when we first started working together, um, everyone had full-time jobs, mainly desk-based jobs, and everyone was a little bit fed up with sitting behind auto cab all day or working in an office and decided we wanted to build something. And came across this article in, in The Independent, which is about um, abandoned petrol stations and had about 4,000 of them across the UK, and the number was rising. Monthly. Um, petrol stations are quite interesting because they're quite often um, at the centre of small towns and small villages, like a kind of classic um, community centre kind of auxiliary thing. Um, but there's a fading piece of infrastructure, fading with the death of the interval, and kind of I guess, the change in the way people move around cities. And there seemed to be quite an exciting parallel between that kind of fading glamour of, of the automobile and Cinemas, which also used to be at the centre of communities, used to be a place of excitement and glamour on Saturday afternoon, and gradually also being shipped out of town um, into Odeons and multiplexes. So it seems to us like there might be something quite exciting about putting them together. Um, so we cycled around London relentlessly for about a month, um, looking for empty petrol stations to be found. One with a wooden lander in Clerkenwell. Um, <laughs> Sounds like it's to it to itself. But the basic concept is that we use the existing canopy as a roof, um, and then we build a, a festoon curtain that would act as the walls. And so um, during the day, it just stands there a bit like a strange petrol station with a funny adage. And then in the evening, the curtains come down, this great swoop, and you get this cinema that's returned to the high street. So this is this is our petrol station that's Carpenter Road, which goes through. Um, uh, from East London to the city, it's really busy, like double-decker buses and police cars hammering down the UK. Um, this is a, used to be a Texaco garage, um, and we had a couple that we found, but this one has got these really quite particularly beautiful um, columns that, that sold us to it. And so this is it, six weeks later, as the Cinerone, um, just after a screening. So the we got funding to do, we started off with no money at all. We won two and a half thousand pounds from the youth charity for Ideas Gap, which is take applications from anyone who's 25. Um, so we basically didn't really have any money to take enough money to, you know, to rent a projector or anything. So we started basically <coughs> looking at the, the big iconographic parts of cinema from the kind of golden age, facades and signs and ticket booths and these amazing festive curtains and looking at ways that we could recreate them with junk, with borrowed found with industrial materials. Um, this, is, this is one of them, this is a classic flip down chair. So the Cinerarium was built by about 250 volunteers over a period of four weeks. Um, all of the seats were constructed by unskilled people who didn't know how to do woodworks. We made this instruction manual that basically showed you how to cut up a piece of, um, um, not like scaffolding boards are only allowed to use for scaffolding for a very limited period of time because they're straight, so they just get thrown out. So we um, spent a long time and made lots of ugly prototypes and so it's sort of this rather wonky but quite charming Mr. Scaffolding. Now some of them see that we have discovered these rather beautiful antique ones from the Cinema Museum, which they rather trust in me and you know. This is a cinema seats in production. So you can see the brakes just built out of scaffolding, which has got um This is, the, this is the kind of headline feature of this cinema. It's a big festing curtain. It's actually made out of roofing insulation fabric called Tyvex. It costs about 30 per square metre. It's incredibly cheap, um, but it handles a bit like paper. Um, so one of the biggest challenges was making it decorative. And we ended up selling about three and a half kilometres of seams in it to turn into a festing curtain on two domestic sewing machines, which was 
<laughs> um, and there it is. Uh, plied the side at the top, which looks a bit like me, and it's just uplit um, painted plywood. There it is. So when you come in, it feels like quite an interior space. You feel quite enclosed. The time it's got this, um, it's a semi permeable membrane. So on the inside, it's got quite a soft, like velvety feel. So it feels quite interior. Um, and then you file in through the back and then take your seats, um, watch your film. And then at the end of the film is the credits roll, the curtains swoosh up. So we had one person on the end of a rope on every curtain, and 15 curtains, and you count down and the Chinese whispers and whoosh. Cat comes up and you're on the clock and we're very uh, wonderful on first reviews compared to having your trousers pulled down in public. Feeling of escapism and, and kind of fantasy that you get in the good cinema and you kind of forget yourself to then be like, you know, out on the main road on Friday night. <laughs> it's quite just. Um, and there it is with the, the curtains up. And in terms of programming, the thing that was ridiculously challenging about the cinema was that that's Got about the, that's got the acoustic insulation properties of the newspaper, basically, but none. Um, and as you can see, it's really right on the bus lane. So um, it actually lent a rather wonderful character to the Cinerarium because it forced us to program films that had car chases and explosions and gunfights and, and <laughs> squealing drinks and something. Um, and that kind of gradually precipitated us into a, a really kind of Americana kind of back road feel. We had like bad lands and jewel and dead on arrival, and there were some really beautiful moments when the sirens came, when real sirens came from shooting cars, you couldn't tell if they were in the soundtrack. Um, this is another project that we did. Um, so at this stage, we're still a fairly unorganized um, group. And we found this site whilst we were building this in a road. This is the A12 flyover, um, and it's creates this kind of totally accidental undercross space by where it joins the, where it, not where it joins, where it has to go over the navigational canal. This is in East London, right by the top point of Olympic Park and Hackney Marsh, which is one of the big, biggest wildlife reserves in London. <coughs> basically accidentally made and completely overlooked, despite the fact that it's opposite one of the largest areas of social housing in East London. There's a definite positive public space in that area. So we took up with the idea of trying to Proof or test its viability as a future public space. Um, um, so there it is, a little bit miserable in a place, really. But and you know, the fence went up after three burnt out vehicles appeared there on the road. It's a bit of a cut off to the public entirely for about three years. Um, and this is how it was made a massive infrastructure project that was about shipping people around London as expediently as possible. But it was it was um, only partially completed this ring road project. Um, the West Wing in uh, West London, quite famous bit of five that goes to Portobello. And then this tiny, tiny section in East London. Um, and the reason it wasn't completed was because of massive local protests. It really just cut straight through communities, but you know, lots of demolition. So when we were starting to think about how to create a narrative or identity for this site, we thought an interesting place to start was to imagine a landlord who refused to move when the motorway was built, and that's why it split as it went over the river to accommodate the roof of the house. Um, so it was kind of like inventing a fairy tale for the site. Um, we had it for we had some funding that lasted for eight weeks. So we were looking at temporary construction. We wanted one that wasn't totally out of sympathy with the local built environment. So we invented this modular construction system that meant anyone could really come on site and join us and go to public. Um, construction period, about 300 people came and had to build this over the four weeks we were building. And the brick, the, these um, reclaimed wooden bricks were drilled with two holes and then threaded with ropes. And they've now all gone and become part of the playground of the primary school, which is down the road, as you can see, which didn't have to build it. But it's uh, kind of a homage and kind of a prestige of, the, of this beautiful but um, rapidly being demolished red brick industrial technology at the end. So there it is before we started, um, and here it is six weeks later. It's fully for a fly over with a little peak pushing up through. Um, and the programming for this space, it was really all about fairy tales and reimagining things. The house looked a bit like a cartoon because of this slightly precarious, like Jenga like look of the, of the essentially bead curtain that formed the, formed the walls. 
and he has all sorts of different activities going on in sketches which is the name of the cinema. But this is this is it at night that's being used in the cinema. Um, so all the projection equipment is rigged onto the flyover, which was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, and then the steps that we can see all the audience, they were sold, ticketed for five pounds, and then all the rest of the space, people would just come in and fill up the food and then buy and have it that's tucked inside underneath. So the programme really looked at the history of animation and make believe and fairy tales. We started off with Snow White, which was Disney's first animation, and took a slightly healthy skelter course that went by Prince Ahmed and Tron. Um, and I guess it was kind of fanciful, but similar to those picture shows about looking at things that we thought were quite beautiful, but that um, maybe weren't, didn't have a place in the nation we expected them to. So you can see the um, speakers uh, and the projector are all held up by acropops, which are things that you normally use this way up for holding up the roof of a house. Um, but we weren't allowed to fix into the undercover to damage anyway, so they just held it by the torqued up and held the loop and went by pressure. Oh no, and the other beautiful thing about the cinema was that during the afternoon and early evenings, the rake um, became a social space. Um, so it's a place people come and drink and, and, and talk, and then we had kids' workshops there, and um, we got quite full, but it was quite. It's quite quite a lovely reverse. It kind of felt like a flea pit theatre rather than kind of sitting in the dark and silent and thing you get kind of out of town in the cinema. And then that's the reality check which is that there were forty thousand cars passing over 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 the twenty foot flyover um, every day. And my favourite moment of this project was when a car broke down just about there when we were seeing Jurassic Park. <laughs> and it was like dry ice exploding up and the AA men came and then we just had this head and we looked up and there was just a row of guys in dress and jackets and I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and yeah, they were peaked down. Um, and really this is, I've tried to stay on the, on the kind of cinematic, well the, the areas of these projects that are I guess, directly interested to the kind of stuff that you guys are looking at, but something that's really, really important for us is Cinema for its own sake, but also for what it can do. And the reason that we use cinema as a lot is because it can be an incredibly democratic way of opening up the space. And it's really cheap, and it's just super, super accessible. You know what you're going to get if you're coming to the film. So in a way, you could use it to entice people into a situation they might not otherwise have done. Um, the really big thing about this project was not so much the kind of physical transformation, but the imaginative transformation, the change in the way that that space is used and thought about. It's now become a, so a small um, permanent community that's there in a bike workshop and the skateboarding classes and stuff. And so really this slide is about how, you know, this is 18 months beforehand, it's not someone you'd ever imagine bringing a uh, you know, three-year-old girl to play, uh, but actually it's mainly through investment and, and thought more than, than money. 